This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Arthur Fleischman. Arthur is a devoted dad, an autism advocate, and the co-author of Carly's Voice, Breaking Through Autism. This remarkable book is one of the first to explore firsthand the challenges of living with autism. It brings readers inside of one's secret world and into the thoughts and feelings of an inspiring young woman, Arthur's daughter, Carly, who has found her voice and her mission. At the age of two, Carly Fleischman was diagnosed with severe autism and an oral motor condition that prevented her from speaking. Doctors predicted that she would never intellectually develop beyond the abilities of a small child. Although she made some progress after years of intensive behavioral and communication therapy, Carly remained largely unreachable. Then, at the age of 10, she had a breakthrough. While working with her devoted therapists, Howie and Barb, Carly reached over to their laptop and typed in, Help Teeth Hurt, much to everyone's astonishment. This was the beginning of Carly's journey towards self-realization. This never published conversation you're about to hear between myself and Arthur Fleischman was recorded in April 2012. My first interview question was, when did Carly begin typing? Carly started typing at the age of 10, so okay. that would have been seven years ago, 2005. Uh -huh. She had her first breakthrough in March. It was spring break 2005 when we were away, and she, uh, she typed the words, help teeth hurt, when she was working with her um, therapist. Absolutely incredible, I'm sure. When you, you were away, um, what was your response when you got the news? Well, we were on the phone with them. They called us up on cell and we were in um, the Grand Canyon. So the connection was not fantastic. And the cell phone weren't <laughs> Did I hear but, that right? <laughs> exactly. I think that was the first thing. I think we said what about six or eight times and uh, we kept getting cut off, which was even worse. <laughs> so we'd drive a little further and then we'd call again. And I guess our first reaction was... Um, we believed that they believed that she had actually typed something, but we wondered whether maybe um, she hadn't really typed the words fully and they just kind of wanted to see it, you know, in some way, or maybe she typed a few letters um, spontaneously because she had some letters. They had been doing sifting and sorting with um, like boggle cubes or, or um, scrabble chips uh -huh. uh, or flashcards, but they were very simple words like her name or the word dog or cat or, you know, three letter words. And they would ask her to point to, you know, they'd spell out dog and you know, whatever, lamp and chair, and they'd say, point to dog, and she'd point to dog. So, you know, we knew she had some sort of receptive language, but she had never spontaneously typed, and she had never even studied the words that she ultimately typed, help teeth and hurt. Um, so, you know, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to us, I'll put it that way. It just, it, it didn't seem logical that this kid would, you know, lean over and start typing on a keyboard. Yeah. Um, so we didn't really believe... Um, we didn't think they were lying. We just thought that maybe something was up that, you know, someone didn't fully understand. Okay. So then you get home from your vacation and then what? So the first few weeks back, she didn't write again. She didn't, uh, she wouldn't write for us. And at that time we didn't have a laptop, um, or a flip or anything like that. I don't even know if flips were around then. Um, and they didn't pull out like the big video camera right away. So, you know, for a couple of weeks, she would write a little bit for Barb and Howie, you know, short sentences and phrases. Um, and I don't think we actually saw her type. I have to check on that, to be honest with you. I don't know that I saw her type for probably a month after we got back. She had been writing. She was writing for Barb and Howie, and Barb would write down everything that Carly wrote because she was doing it off this augmentative communication device, which didn't have a printer or any kind of um, storage. So uh, Barb would write down anything that Carly wrote, and then she would tell us about it. You know, you know, I, I've seen the more recent writing and it's, it's remarkable writing. And, and so I'm wondering at the very beginning, what did the writing, uh, how did it come out in terms of the articulation that we see now? Yeah. So it was very simple stuff. Like if you read in the book, you'll read some of the earlier things, they'd be, um, you know, once, once we moved on, I'll, I'll jump over like the eight weeks there. Once we saw her type, we worked hard to find a, a PC that we could, you know, get our hands on. They were still fairly expensive. The laptops were quite expensive still. Um, 
but I think my sister-in-law had one, so we, we, an old one, so we gave that one to her. And we got her pretty quickly onto instant messaging on MSN. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barb had this idea that she seemed to like to write with me, so she thought, okay, you know, you boot up your I am at work, and Carly will boot it up here, and you guys can actually chat with each other. But the language was fairly simple construct, short phrases, things like, hi, Dad, can we go for a walk? Colin says how he made me get a funny haircut, like like kind of stilted English. Was it all spelled correctly? No, okay. no. A lot of times it was spelled phonetically. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of things were spelled correctly, which was kind of surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, these are fairly simple words, right? right. And, um, and in terms of um, the, the physical effort that it took for her to hunt and peck the letters, um, how long would it take her, for example, to write, I got a funny haircut? That actually has not improved as much as you might think. So that could take, you know, 15 minutes to write three words. Wow. She'd sort of sit, finger would hover over the keyboard and she'd press and then hover and then she'd, you know, hit herself and jump around or whatever. <laughs> so on a good day when she felt calm and focused, she could knock that out in a minute. And on a bad day, it could take her an hour. I mean, there are days I, 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 what I try to do in the book is show an instant message conversation. And if you look across the top, I, um, I record the time code. Mm-hmm. So you can see that I'll respond in 15 seconds and I may not hear back from her for 12 or 15 minutes. I see. That's, uh, that's interesting. Okay. So, so what that tells me is a great motivation on her part to continue this laborious process. So that and that's she- what she says. Yeah. She says, you know, this takes a ton of work. It's way too hard for me to write. Um, it's gotten a little bit easier, but you know, she says this just, I need to be able to speak because this is just way too much work for me to be able to type. It's too hard for me to sit still it's too hard for me to focus, you know, the, all the other noises and sounds and smells and all of that sort of interfere with her ability to focus on the keyboard and focus on what she wants to say. So if she had her druthers, she would, she'd be able to speak, obviously. Is there, is there another interface that might make it easier for her to get her words out? I don't know. We, we've tried everything. I mean, she does use the touch screen on an iPad. She's had an iTouch. Um, WordQ has sentence and word prediction, which speeds it up a little bit. When she's hugely motivated, like right now, she's trying to um, uh, get somebody at Google to give her a Google Doodle. You know what that is? You no, know how- but, but I, I saw on her, on her Twitter feed that she was uh, reaching out to people at Google. Yeah, and what she wants is, and she thought of it a little a little late, unfortunately, but uh, you know how Google will change their logo mm-hmm. uh, special occasions for a day or two? Uh-huh. That's called a Google Doodle. Oh, okay. And she wants them to change it for Autism Awareness Month and, uh, and specifically for Carly's Voice um, and for a website we're about to launch. I was just looking at it just before you called, called Car- Carly's Cafe, which will be an interactive website that... Um, simulates what it feels like her to sit in a cafe and try to order a cup of coffee. Wow. So her, over the years, she's become more articulate inside the speed of getting the words out is a little bit better. And some of you asked me if the, if there are better interfaces, you know, there've been some minor improvements with, um, with word queue and, you know, type to voice and sentence and word and sentence prediction has helped her uh, a little bit. Mm-hmm. But her language has become very sophisticated, and she said now she can write enormous passages in her head and remember them verbatim, and then when her head is clear and she has time, she then types it out. As a writer, I certainly admire that that gift. (laughs) Admire, and I'm jealous of it. Really, that that is, well, amazing that she could just, you know, compose it, shelve it, wait until... Till, uh, till the area out. is clear and quiet and just take the time to sit down. And That's yeah. how she did her chapter. Like, she was very late getting her chapter written. Um, I was already in editing, and I was coming to the end of my editing, and I said, look, if you can't do it, it's no disgrace, but I need to know because I need to rejig the ending of the book because it, it's written for your chapter, and she hadn't shared anything with us. I had no idea what she was planning to write. I'd given her some thought starters, all of which she ignored, uh, no surprise, because she is a teenager. And once she got it out, uh, of course, I loved what she wrote. I had a couple of suggestions in terms of maybe talking about what, you know, her future plans were, or what have you. And she said, no, it's it, it's done. I'm like, well, how about editing? No, it's done, it's done. So we cleaned up some of the typos. Um, I don't even think we fixed the syntax. So some of the sentences are a little boggy, but um, um that's how she writes. She writes it all in her head, and she she says she has 
pretty much the rest of her um, this other book that she was working on, Elephant Princess, she says she pretty much has it done in her head as well. Does she, does she read other people's writing in terms of memoir or that kind of writing that she does? Well, we've always read a lot. I mean, the books, we used to read a lot more than we do now. She just doesn't have as much time and her um Routines are a little different, but bedtime always started with, with a book. Uh, and she used to like um, Harry Potter, to, although, interestingly, she never read Harry Potter, uh, but she liked that genre. Uh, there was uh, Annie Sage's Flight, and I can't remember, that was like a trilogy or a, it was a trilogy. So those types of, you know, modern meets old English, you know, spy drama kind of, you know, type stuff. Um, we still read a lot, and she reads a lot for school now. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't read because she doesn't really have the motor skills to hold the book and flip the pages. Right. Um, so, you know, we've thought about or used on occasion audiobooks, or she likes it when I read to her. So, you know, I'll still try to read to her a bit. Um, interestingly, when she reads, she just looks at, she just looks at the printed page and photographs it. She sort of scans it. You mean mentally photographs it? Yeah. Yeah. She just, you just have to hold it for her and she'll tap your shoulder and you flip the page, flip the page flip the page. And then if you asked her about what she read, her retention is... It's about 90-odd percent. It's really, really it's amazing. Stunning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Howard claims she can count cards. I, I, um, <laughs> seen it. I've seen her do it, although it, I wasn't quite sure if what I was seeing was, was accurate, where you know he'll flip the cards and he'll say the eight card was what? She'll type eight of hearts. Um, with pretty good accuracy. I mean, more than, 50, more than statistical guessing. More yeah. than 50 percent. Amazing. Accurate. You know, when I... F- first um, read her writing, I immediately thought of Anne Frank. We've read Anne Frank. That one we did on audiobook, actually. I, I, I'm very, um, you know, as I say, as a writer myself, I'm, I'm very tuned into to cadence and to word structure, and there is something similar to me in the voices that that's what struck me about it. There's something. And how old was Anne Frank when she was what, 14 when she wrote it? Uh, sh- she was oh. in hiding between the ages of uh, 14 and 16. So, you know, they're teenagers. Yeah, they were teenagers. Just, yeah, and it, it's not so much the voice of a young person as it is the purity and, and, and just raw honesty of it. There's no bullshit about it. There's, right. there's, there's no equivocation. It's all, this is me, and this is what's going on with me right now, and here it is, right, for you to all see. Well, I think in both cases there is a, an inability to waste, right? So in Anne yeah. Frank's time, she had no time to waste. She had no materials to waste. Um, she just had to kind of get it out there. And in Carly's case, typing is so laborious that she has figured out a way to write with very clean efficiency. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean she's always succinct. I mean, she does sometimes write verbosely, but every sentence is meaningful and tightly packed. Yes. Which really impresses me. She's at a very young age. She learned how to uh, manipulate emotionally um, and even joke about it. Like she'll (laughs) do something and then she'll say, see, it's called guilt. I'm good at it. You know, (laughs) Um, and you'll see some of her letters, uh, um, you know, being Jewish, she likes to play that up that, Uh you know, that's something that, that she comes by naturally. Yeah, uh, I, I, I detected that a little bit. I'm Jewish too, and so yeah. it's like, okay, I, I, I get that. It, it's subtle, and there, there is a, a fun side of, you know, I'm poking you. <laughs> I'm poking you. I'm manipulating you, and I'm poking you. And, but, then, but she has really wonderful um, cadence to her writing. And, yes, um, that's what I picked You know, there's, uh, I don't know if you ever studied uh, religiously at all, but... Um, yes, I, wa- I was bat mitzvahed and uh, went through that whole thing uh, until I was 18, actually. And so do you remember, I don't know if you recall, because I used to go to a, an Orthodox synagogue, uh, there's a structure to, to Jewish prayer, and I can't remember what the acronym is you know you open with um, praise right and uh-huh. then you, uh, I think then you um, ask your favor you ask your question and then you rationalize it then you thank and then you praise again or something like that but uh-huh. there's a structure and it's not different from the way people used to talk to the monarchy you know uh-huh. to the king thank you very much you're such a generous kind king and you're so wonderful I'm just this poor little schlep and I'm starving could I have some money because I can't feed my you know my kids because you're such a wise and powerful king, and thank you very much. Like, there's this pattern to it. And when you read Carly's writing, when she's requesting something, 
she she has a consistent pattern. I think it's, she's figured out how it works, and she usually starts, you know, sort of like a an introduction, and then she usually gives some sort of an example, whether it be about Albert Einstein or Temple Grandin or whatever. Um, she has some sort of impressive kind of fact that she puts in there. Um, she'll then kind of work your heart a little bit. She'll talk about how, you know, my parents were told to put me in a group home when I was eight years old, and that I wouldn't develop beyond a six year old, and you know. Then she'll usually then she'll use some humor. She'll get you right to tears, and then she uses a joke. You know, if I, if if my doctors had been weathermen, I'd be wearing boots all the time. You know, that <laughs> like cracks a joke so that you don't cry. And then she says, and then she sums it up with something very powerful, like you know, my mission is to help change the world's understand. So she has these patterns, and I, when I go back now and reread, particularly over the past six months since the book is written, I'm seeing an even greater level of sophistication in the way she petitions for. You know, for um, I won't even call it help, but she'll petition people to get involved in a cause or something that she's working on, and I think that's a very sophisticated. Th- that that usually requires some education and like writing skills. Yes, <laughs> yeah. There's there's a difference between what I would call them as a, a self-involved self-expression, which is just me and my journal and writing it out, versus an, a a real awareness that you're writing for an audience. Uh, exactly, exactly. And the first time we noticed it was in the letter she wrote to Ellen DeGeneres. Uh-huh. Uh, sorry, the first thing we noticed was her speech that she wrote for her bat mitzvah. And in it, she had jokes, but we didn't really totally know knew that she had a, a sense of humor. So the jokes came across as insulting. Like she, one of the opening lines of her speech was, um, uh, I was told that people came on trains and planes, um, you know, whatever, just to see me. Okay, you can go now. It's a joke. And when I say it, you laugh. But if you read it straight out as one long continuous sentence, you'd say, you know, honey, you can't really say that to people because they, you know, they're, they're here and they're paying money for a hotel. Like that's insulting. It's a joke. It's, and she clearly knew it was a joke. And in fact, what we then realized uh, shortly after she completed the, uh, or didn't even have the, the speech completed, she wanted Ellen DeGeneres to read it. And when you read it carefully, you see that it was written in Ellen DeGeneres's rhythm. Ah, I, I want to ask about about Carly and um, her relationships with her peers. So she um, has always preferred to be around non autistic or non challenged kids, which uh-huh. I always found both heartless and interesting at the same time. <laughs> interesting uh, way to put it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean she has she has very good friends in LA who have similar challenges, and she loves them, and she loves to hang out with them. But in general, like when she's gone to a special, uh, like an ABA-based autism school here, she's made no friends and made no effort to be friends with them. And she said she finds it kind of depressing to be around, only around kids with autism. Um, Probably back then in particular, because she wanted so badly to go to a mainstream high school, which she couldn't do back then. Today, she's probably more accepting, but she's also most proud of the fact that she has neurotypical friends and she hangs out with you know, boys who are on the football or, or hockey team and, and, you know, girls, you know, regular, typical 17-year-old girls. Now, they're all in the gifted program, so they tend to be uh, kind of special souls, these kids. Yes. They're very mature. They're very intelligent. They're very accepting. They're very intrigued by Carly. Uh, I find the mainstream kids are more typical mainstream kids. Like, you know, here's this weird kid who makes funny noises and can't speak. They don't have a lot to do with her. But um, but now she does, uh, you know, school activities with them. She loves to work in groups, and she hates to let her, her peers down, so she always wants her work to be excellent. Um, the kids are incredibly supportive of her. Like, it's it blows me away how we've never had any kind of, you know, bullying. What's like, What would the equivalent of racism be here, you know? Uh, well, it's just, it's, it's, pretty, it's so. pure harassment because of differences. That's really what it's about. It doesn't really matter what the thing is that makes a child be perceived as different, but that's pretty much what it is. Well, well you've brought up a really interesting point now. I want to kind of segue into um, Carly's experience and yours as a parent of a kid with special needs in this way. Um, in terms of how typical is it now? Everything I've I've seen of 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 Carly on video and and hearing you speak about her, she's a very very special young woman, and and she's she's clearly gifted in many many ways. Um, does she still have autism? Yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering that when when you go t- to speak. Um, when people got in touch with you as a result of this first news story, um, 
other parents um, looking desperately for hope, how do you talk with them about what may be a very different situation for them in, in terms of what you've experienced? Yeah, um, I think the most helpful piece of information uh, I got was from a doctor not that long ago, maybe last year. And he said, you really have to think of the autism population much like the neurotypical population. I mean, it's a bell curve and you're going to have some kids. So first is the spectrum, right? We know that there's a spectrum disorder, but then even within the spectrum, so you might have severely autistic kids, there's a bell curve around those severely autistic kids. Some of them are brighter and some of them are less bright. Some of them have more sense of humor and some have less sense of humor. There's no reason to believe that some of those other parts of the brain that are not affected by autism aren't just the same as, you know, the neurotypical population. Good so, point. Right? right? So that helps me a little bit because what I can say is Carly had her breakthrough because we were relentless with therapy from age two to present. She still gets therapy uh, every day. Um, occupational therapy, speech language, communication therapy, and ABA therapy. Uh, medication has played a big part in helping her get through the rougher years. Um, so we were relentless there. We're, we've been relentless with technology. So she's been surrounded by technology since age, well, before age 10. I mean, she was using an augmentative communication device. It wasn't beautiful technology, but it was technology. Um, and then light writers, she was working on a light writer for a while. So we've really pushed hard there. And so we've seen an incredible breakthrough. Will every parent see that degree of breakthrough? No. But if you can afford to, uh, both emotionally and financially, get your kid this much intervention, you will likely see some form of improvement and breakthrough. And I can't guarantee that your kid will have the kinds of insight and humor and, you know, writing abilities that Carly has. But the flip side is I look around at some of my peers and their kids and I go, oh my God, these kids are gorgeous and brilliant and gifted athletes and getting straight A's at the top private schools. My kids don't get that, you know, like not every, not everybody gets everything, right? Like not everybody gets sort of superior intelligence. Right. You know, um, I, I just, um, I just interviewed Shannon DeRoches Rosa, who is one of the editors on a new book called The Thinking Person's Guide to Autism. Oh, yeah. It, it's a wonderful book. I'm so, so impressed with the collection of essays that come from parents who are dealing with, with all kinds of, uh, special challenges around around uh, this diagnosis. And my, my thought about it is that, yes, as you say, there's a wide, a wide, wide range and, and hope is extraordinarily important. And I, I think it's, it's, you obviously are in a financial position to have invested what you did in terms of time and money. And I guess, I guess um, where I'm going with this is that there are parents with limited means. And, and their kids are no less deserving of, of this kind of therapy and, and special help that they need to have their kids reach their potential. And so what do you say to them? So uh, all I can say to them is, uh, that is why my wife, in spite of not really wanting to do this or being, you know, it being her chosen vocation has devoted all of her spare time to advocating for parents like that. We um, were behind the Weinbergs and Fleischmanns were behind uh, the original lawsuit against the province of Ontario, a charter of rights case that lasted almost 10 years uh, through all of this. I don't write about it in the book because the book largely sells in the U.S. and they don't really have the same interest in the Ontario you know, court system. But we sued the government uh, now three times and we continue to advocate now without litigation. We continue to advocate with uh, various ministries within the government um, because we agree that cancer treatment is not financially based. I mean, you could argue it is for some people because they can get access to special services, but by and large in Canada, if you have cancer, you go to the hospital, you get treatment. And if you have autism, you don't necessarily get treatment. So that to me seems like a charter of rights breach. Uh, where are you based? I live in San Francisco. Okay, so uh, so this is I'm speaking a little bit of gibberish, I guess. No, no, not uh, at all. Because then these are you know the the topic is the substance of what you're saying that to advocate for kids with special needs goes across all atypical kids, no matter what we're actually talking about. And and it's interesting to me because I I am an advocate of 
public education. And yet, you know, it's interesting. I, I just got an email from a mom today, which is the kind of the other side of something that I had not really thought about it. Her daughter's in the fifth grade. And the gist of her email was that there are kids with behavioral issues in in her daughter's school, particularly one in her daughter's class. And um, because of the mainstreaming ethos, these this particular child is um, in in a, a class where it, it sounds like there's a mismatch. Um, mm-hmm. The child's very aggressive. And as a result, her daughter, who used to love school, doesn't want to go to school anymore because she seems to be targeted by this highly aggressive child. From the mother's perspective, the kid is given free reign. So, you know, she says, you know, what can we do? It, it, it's an interesting and yet, you know, not at all simple problem with with just one so. yeah no i'm telling you yeah, we had that question we, i was just in um santa monica for book signing last weekend and uh there were a number of families that raised the question you just asked and i said okay unfortunately i'm not that familiar though there was a friend of mine there john Shestak, who's a producer his wife's portia iverson i don't know if you know portia yes, yes. Um, so portia couldn't come but dove and dove and uh, and john came and i said gee i i think that i'm hearing that there is more insurance reform i think california in fact just passed recent insurance reform that will push back to private insurance the requirement to pay for some of this therapy and then it's up to the schools to allow them into the classroom right so if there's a kid there who is aggressive but for other reasons could be mainstreamed then i'd say mainstream them but mainstream them with a one-on-one who knows how to handle it right and you know what carly did was in the very beginning she was mainstreamed and then pulled out for chunks of time to work on special skills that seemed to work really well until a point where she couldn't even sit in the classroom for the minimum amount of time. So then we were homeschooling her. We couldn't find the right classrooms. Terrible. It was like just, we were, you know, we were the wandering Jews there for a while. Yeah. Uh, now she's back in a mainstream high school taking gifted classes with a one-on-one. And what Howie, Howie works in the afternoon and, and Dana turns out to be a sister. So it's a brother-sister team. Nice. Works in the morning. Um, and what they try to do is they'll fade um uh, to the degree that Carly wants them, wants them to or is comfortable with it, she'll sit at the you know the desk or the table or whatever, and they'll step back a bit, and then they'll step out of the class. And Howard says now, actually, in most of his classes, he spends a good part of the time out in the hall just sort of watching her. But if she has a bad day, like she used to a year or two ago, he's right there. So he can redirect her, get her out of the classroom, so he doesn't disrupt you know, she doesn't disrupt the class. Interesting. Um, it's a fairly expensive model, though. So back yeah, to this bet. conversation started. What do you do? I think, you know, if your kid is very severe, autism schools make sense with the goal of mainstreaming them. And then once you mainstream them, support them sufficiently, which usually with the more severe cases means a one-on-one with the goal of withdrawing that as much as possible. But that's a very laborious, expensive um protocol for a condition that now affects one in 88 kids. Yeah, that's what we're hearing. Um, yeah. You mentioned meds, and I was curious about that. So uh, I won't preach either way. I mean, we tend to be, we tend to favor <laughs> pharmaceuticals. Um, not we, so much. We meaning you and your my wife? wife and or? <laughs> no, my wife and I, I was going to say not recreationally, but <laughs> <laughs> there are days where you, you know, where you kind of like that. Um no, Carly went through a very bad period at age, I think she was age 11. We were really struggling with her behavior, a lot of, you know, hitting herself and jumping around and putting her head through walls and not sleeping. And we finally uh, pushed the hospital uh, for sick children, sick kids hospital to admit her. Um, and, you know, because any test that they, they, they did on her, they found nothing, like nothing, you no know, issues with her stomach or her eyes or her head or anything that would be causing pain. Um, and they tried, uh, we finally found a, a pharmacologist, a um, psychiatric pharmacologist who said, you know, my expertise is not autism, but, you know, we can try some different things. And the first things that seemed to help was actually something that my wife pushed was uh, pushed on her was um, something for restless leg. And because Carly was complaining that her legs felt like they were on fire and, you know, and Tammy kept saying, that sounds like restless leg. And the doctor said, I have restless leg. That is not what it feels like. I don't think it is, but it, you know, shouldn't have any negative side effects. So let's give it a shot. And we gave it a shot. Um, and it, 
helped almost immediately, like within weeks. Uh, not completely, and so we've used other things like gabapentin, which is an anti-seizure medication that is also used for um, neuralgia, I guess various nerve pain, because Carly had been like hitting herself. Um, and she said, it, you know, it might work on a couple of pathways that, that could be beneficial. So, you know, we've done things like that, um, some mood stabilizers, because she used to have, she said, just these wildly fluctuating moods where she'd be laughing one minute and in tears like 10 minutes later. And she said it was driving her crazy, like she just could not control the, the seesaw of her moods. Um, more recently, over the past six months, she wants to be off all medication and her, um, her doctor supports her her wish and doesn't think it's, it's not dangerous as long as it's handled properly. So she's very, very slowly withdrawn from all medication. Um, and, you know, by the end of this year, I imagine she'll be off everything. And then they can take a look, see at what's available and what they're trying to target. Really, her bigger issues to target right now are her OCD. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, th I think what everyone wants is to try a clean slate and see what Carly is like, completely free of any medication. Um, you know, clean out the system and then re re reinvestigate. It's a really interesting story that you tell there. You know, I, I was struck by the difference, just the physicality of her movements in, in the uh, ABC piece. From, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, and then the lead into the later pieces, you know, these days Carly's much calmer and I go, wow, look yeah. at her there. She's, you know, <laughs> very different. And, and yeah, she's not, but, but they shot it a little bit that way. I mean, if you saw her over a protracted period, you'll still see the, Yes, you know. some of that, but it it seemed it seemed to indicate that part of that calmness was coming from this newfound ability to express herself so that others could understand, and not so much, huh? I don't think so. I mean, okay. that's that's the way ABC wanted to sling it. I think that two things, yes, in part, and she has said that she she's as she'll say, you try going around for two days and not talking. And let people talk about you in front of you, say things that are incorrect, and you can't go, no, 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 that, that's not how it happened. Like, you, you can't speak. And yes, you will be incredibly frustrated. So I do think some of the outbursts, but we could sort of see the difference. And we would say to her during certain outbursts, you know, that's not autism, that's misbehavior. And we can tell the difference. Um, and so you need to learn how to control the misbehavior part of it and find other ways, you know, other outlets, not the least of which is to communicate. Um, either write or use the uh, proloquo to go. Then there are times where she says her body just feels like it's being possessed by demons and she has no control over it. And that's more the OCD, right? That's where she feels like she has to do something like, you know, go through a door a certain way or, you know, something else. And if she can't, she said it feels like she's being stabbed from the inside out. So that is something that there really is no cure for. I mean, there's CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which um, we do sort of a modified version of it now. We'd like to try to do a full-blown version of it uh, as soon as we can, and certain medications, but medications have not proven to be terribly effective on, um, on severe OCD. Um, tell me, Arthur, has, has Carly had um, much opportunity, either through her blog, um, her Facebook page, or in face-to-face -face events to talk with other kids um, who are autistic and maybe have more more verbal skills than she does, but, you know, just to make that connection so that they have more verbal skills, but she's got, she's got the linguistic stuff going for her. So I wonder um, how, what kind of connection she's made within that community. Most of the connection she's made in the community comes on Facebook where mm -hmm. she responds to people and some of them are, young adults with autism or Asperger's and she does respond back. And then she has three very good friends in LA, um, Portia and, and John's son, um, Elaine Hall. I don't know if you know Elaine, uh, her son and, and, uh, and her, her other friend, Gabby Valner. Um, none of them are really verbal Gabby a little bit, but generally it's kind of, it's interestingly, she kind of speaks nonsensically, but she's, extraordinarily bright. In fact, she also, she's going on to do a program at UCLA, I think next year. Um, all of them are exceedingly bright, uh, beautiful writers, poetry, creative writing, very articulate, uh, but don't speak. And she does write with them and they exchange, uh, but sometimes not. And she said, you know, it's so hard for us to write. We're okay. Like we're just, we just hang out together. We go for a walk on the boardwalk in Santa Monica or we'll go out you know, for, for lunch or something. And they kind of sit together and 
we half joke that they have sort of an ESP kind of way of communicating <laughs> each other. I think these kids do have, you know, what Carly says is she can hear and see things that most of us cannot. Um, she can hear conversations going on down the hall, upstairs, you know, like out of our earshot, out of our conscious earshot. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that what that says to me is these kids have a hypersensitivity. Yeah, yeah. Um, we know that anyway. Mm -hmm. And with hypersensitivity, you know, sometimes in pop culture, there are people who go, oh, they can read minds. Actually, I think there are just some people that are extraordinarily sensitive. They pick up on the slightest twitch of your mouth, your eye, your eyebrow, and from that can infer you're angry, you're happy, you're surprised, mm -hmm. and it almost looks like they're reading your minds. And Carly is the same way because she's played back things that I know we haven't talked about. And I don't believe she literally reads my mind, but I believe she reads my mood and my body. And, you know, she'll say things like, you were really, you know, pissed at me about this. And it's like, uh, why? We never really talked about it. You know? But she just kind of picks up on things. So I don't, I don't know that she always has to talk to these kids. I think just sometimes being around them, mm -hmm. they sort of kind of share a common bond. I wonder, uh, I wonder if they perceive her in any way as a spokesperson for them. Oh, they, generally they do. And again, if you go on Facebook, those certainly the more um, verbal ones who get on and write, they will say thank you for, for, for being our voice and for, mm -hmm. you know, for speaking for us in a way that we can't speak. Yeah. She's loving the book launch thing. I mean, she finds it overwhelming, but she also, she, she has been waiting for this kind of celebrity attention so yeah. that she has people listening to her message. And if you read her message, it's very consistent and it's always, it's never about her. She'll always say, I'm not that special. What's, you know, and then she goes on to say, you know, what's important is that you start looking at kids with uh, nonverbal autism as intelligent people with lots to say. Yeah. Um, she wrote a wonderful line for her speech. She said, um, how did she put it on my botch it? She said something to the effect of it's, it's, you know, criminal that you give up on us because we haven't given up on ourselves. Wow. Um, and it's very powerful, right? It like, is. Um, and that's kind of her message. Like, as she says, you got to come to the horse's mouth. You don't try to say, when you want to find out if the horse is sick, you don't ask a duck. <laughs> This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about Carly's story, visit carlysvoice.com. To learn more about my work with teens and parents, visit anniefox.com. And tune in next week for a new podcast. Until then, happy parenting. Mm -hmm.